All right, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on live streaming today and tomorrow, the final session for Live Streaming Summit 2017. Uh, at this conference, whether in keynotes, other sessions, or on the exhibit floor, you've been hearing a lot about what's happening on the leading edge of streaming. This is the session where we're going to spend a little bit more time peering into the future, what's coming next beyond the leading edge that you see out on the floor today. Our panelists today will share their perspectives on how both the technology and the business of live streaming will evolve in the months and years to come. We encourage you, while we're having this discussion, if you have questions, you hear something that's interesting or you want further clarification on, to raise your hand and ask the question, and we'll repeat it so our audience at home can also participate and hear what you're saying. Uh, but we want to make it interactive. So if you have questions, please feel free to jump in at any time. All right, so let's start off with introducing our fine panelists. I'll, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Chris Nolt, and I'm with a company called Blue Frame Technology, focusing on live sports streaming. Uh, rest of our panel, let's start with you, Dan, and uh, kind of work our way down and have everyone introduce themselves. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Dan Sweeney with LinkedIn. I uh, work on the media productions team, and we do live production and also the streaming aspects uh, from LinkedIn. So those are ex internal shows and external facing streams. My name is uh, Dror Gill. I'm the CTO at Beamer. Uh, Beamer develops the world's fastest H.264 and HEVC software encoders, and we provide them to our customers, who are mainly MSOs, telcos, and uh, OTT providers. Yeah, Marion. Uh Ruiz from Streamlabs. Um, we create tools for streamers uh, on Twitch and YouTube Live to uh, you know, help them grow and monetize their channels. Hi, I'm John Petricelli. I'm the founder of Bulldog Digital Media. We are a live streaming agency and strategy company focused on premium live content experiences. My team and I have been in the space for about 14 years. Previously, I ran a live streaming services business. I sold into AEG, and there we powered things like Coachella, and Bonnaroo, and Rock and Rock and Rio, and major music festivals, and the Grammys, and Oscars, and Masters. So uh, we're uh, looking forward to joining this conversation today. And I'm Skip Peasy, VP of um, Technology Education and Outreach at the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters. We're a uh, trade association based in DC, uh, representing licensed radio and television broadcasters and networks. Um, in, uh, in Washington, and uh, we also do a number of um, external uh, events. Uh, probably most familiar to you, uh, many of you is the NAB show in Las Vegas uh, every year, and um, also looking forward to, uh, to uh, talking on this subject uh, from what the broadcaster's uh, perspe perspective is for future of uh, live streaming. Great, thank you all, okay. Well, one thing that most of us assume is that streaming in general, both live and on demand, will increasingly be part of our lives. Uh, studies continue to find that video is more engaging than written or audio-only input and may be more exponentially more effective as a training tool and is quickly growing to represent about 80% of internet traffic. Live streaming in particular is compelling as the power of now grabs the attention of the public, whether in live sporting events, live coverage of breaking news, or just watching friends and social icons broadcasting on the social media platforms such as Facebook. The bigger question for us is probably just how live streaming will continue to grow and what might accelerate or decelerate that trend. Panelists, let's start with growth. What are your thoughts on the key drivers of live streaming growth in the next few years? Who'd like to field that one first? Try and jump in. Um, the obvious one is user-generated content. Um, Facebook Live, well, really it started off with the meerkats of the world and the periscopes, and now Facebook Live, um, the, um, the number of contributions coming through Facebook Live um, you know, outweighs any, any other platform, really. And so that, for me, is there's more content going to be created. Is, uh, I'll, let me throw out a sort of, I don't know, <laughs> a question that may be one you don't want to answer, I don't know, but when, when I think about LinkedIn as being sort of a platform for business as opposed to a social media platform and all the possibilities, especially now being part of Microsoft and video, do you, can you talk about where you're headed with this LinkedIn and how you plan to use video? I can't talk about that, but it would make a lot of sense <laughs> for LinkedIn to be live, I think. Have live streaming, certainly. Okay, fair enough. All right, who else would like to address the question of um, I think a lot of the growth will come 
from the basic fact that uh, the broadcast industry is moving to over the top. Mm. So anything that is done today over the air, on cable, on satellite, is moving more and more uh, to be uh, done over the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so w when we think about growth of the live streaming market, it's actually uh, part of this growth will be in the transition from traditional broadcast uh, networks, such as cable, satellite, and over the air, to broadcast over the, of, over the internet, OTT. Mm -hmm. And uh, w when the live uh, channels are going uh, over the top, then, of course, the, uh, the number of uh, subscribers that are accessing the same content, the same channel content, broadcast um, channels of today over the internet will just uh, continue to grow. Uh, but I also agree that in terms of contribution and the variety of content sources, then UGC will probably uh, represent the largest growth. Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> yeah, um, I agree. Content is king, um, especially on Twitch and YouTube Live. You can watch people play games, um, you know, people eat, people uh, <laughs> play music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you, you see like uh, in, in Korea, you can, you can watch someone like binge food and it's, you know, people watch it. Uh, and a lot of people support it, and um, you know, it, it's. Uh, uh, I think it's definitely going to contribute to the growth of live streaming, um, because a lot of these people do this full time, where they can actually make money, uh, you know, uh, streaming a video game, and you know, their supporters are donating to them, um, using Streamlabs. <laughs> Uh, we believe that a, a lot of the growth and acceleration of live streaming is going to be fueled by Madison Ave and live streaming as a solution to some of the significant problems that marketers and advertisers face today. And coming into this year, there were two, and I think now there's a, a third. But there's no disputing the cord cutting epidemic that the country or in the world is in. The numbers are like 700,000 households will cut the cord this year. In addition to, you know, you have also that number is a lot, you know, a majority of millennials have either cut the cord or never even adopted that traditional form of consumption. Next is the propagation of ad blockers on connected devices. That's now at our, uh, 615 million plus devices have ad blockers actively installed on them. Hmm. And then thirdly, this year we saw the, the growth of uh, brand security and brand safety. So advertisers advertising next to content they have no control over, dubious nefarious, dangerous uh, propaganda or fake news type of content. We found the solution that's resonating with the brands is, is live video. So now you have a full-on engaged consumer who wants to opt into a live experience brought to you by the brand. And furthermore, you've got a, a, a focus on, uh, in, our, in, in the world, you've got a, the world is moving to an experience economy. People want to be at experiences, uh, that's a priority for them in their lives versus you know, buying a house or a watch or a car. And if they can't be there, they want to have a collaborative participatory experience and, and tune into that live engagement. So we see the, the, one of the major drivers being brand and advertising investment into this medium. And from the broadcast side, just in terms of quantitative growth, today, pretty much every radio station is live streaming all the time, has been for a while. Television, not so much. And that's not a technical uh, limitation. It's more because of the rights that are different between radio uh, content and television content that exist. And that's what is starting to change on the TV side. We're seeing more um, agreements being made to allow more television stations to stream more of their content. <coughs> Part of that is through the uh, enablement of uh, geofencing technology like uh, SyncBack is one that's a company called SyncBack has enabled the platform that CBS is using for their all access uh, mobile streaming platform that does allow stations uh, to full time stream their content mm -hmm. through uh, the, the app. Um, and so that's where we see uh, just a lot of television stations, the thousand plus stations in the US adding to the 15,000 plus radio stations in the U.S. that are, are already full-time streaming. And some of those radio stations do m multiple streams, stuff that's not on their air, or they repurpose stuff that's on their air. So you have actually more things. Uh, whereas today, um, television stations, mostly if they do anything that for the content they own themselves, like their local news, it'll be a, uh, an on-demand 
type rather than a live stream. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the shift that we'll see is, we'll see, I think, more television stations doing at least one, if not multiple, live streams in addition to their broadcast. All right, thank you. Well, I think you've all touched sort of around this question. Maybe it, we can address it a little bit more head on. That's around content. So you've talked a little about UGC and, and some of the content being created by sort of traditional broadcasters and using that for streaming. But do you, maybe I can get a few of you at least to comment on what you see as the most likely form of content. Dan, you were suggesting UGC. But do you think we'll also see more highly produced content or more reality TV style content where it's sort of like the, the shaky can and the Blair Witch trial version, you know, th that kind of stuff? Or is it going to be just the, uh, you know, where it's a low budget production? Or is it going to be UGC? What do you think as far as where we're going to see the content coming from? Uh -oh. um, I, I see both. I mean, my main role is actually creating high production value content. Okay. So there's a place for that. When, when I'm sitting through some of these other sessions, the one piece that struck me was this, this VR 360 idea and how mm -hmm. people could go and see their own view and how that, some people don't want that, right? So there, there's still this, this piece where you need someone to be that producer, to be that director and, and point the camera at the right place and, and curate content and put it up there. So that's the piece I concentrate on and I think there's still opportunity to do that because you can do that considerably easier and cheaper than you used to be able to do. So mm -hmm. that's, it's clearly still going to be there um, for me. OK, makes sense. I think another challenge here is, um, is content discovery. Because when you have so much live content available from advertiser, from brands, from television stations all around the world uh, that are broadcasting live, how do you find the right content that is of interest to you? How do you curate different types of content? How do you search? live broadcast content. Mm -hmm. I think that would be um, a really a major issue for all of the live streaming uh, going forward. Um, today on Facebook, uh, there's been sort of a replacement of traditional media because your friends are the creators of the media. You see what they found interesting, what links they are sharing. And this consists of your uh, news stream, and that's how you get your information. So I think perhaps something similar to that can happen for live streams, where your mm -hmm. friends will create and you will see uh, each one of your friends what type of live stream they are watching at that moment. And then you can see like local ratings among your friends, what's the most popular. Uh, and this can help uh, you know, guide your decisions on what you want to watch uh, at any given moment, now that you're going to have you know, thousands and millions of broadcasts up in the air at, at any given time. Right. To follow up on that, I think part of that is the algorithm that is behind Facebook or a LinkedIn that's going to promote that into your feed, right? So there's this idea that you now are living off a feed rather than going out and, and finding content. So I that's what I would add to that, just the, this idea of uh, video and live streaming in particular in a feed now. Think of it that way a little differently. I, I, I'll, I'll sort of play on that a little bit. That's certainly something that I think becomes a driver of growth in the sense that now if I happen to be in Facebook or LinkedIn and I see either my friends are watching a piece of content or it gets promoted as a piece of content, that makes my discovery con my, my content discovery a lot easier, right? So I, that sounds like what you're saying sort of is those kinds of feeds and, and that kind of interaction, bringing this content to me rather than me having to go find it helps with the content discovery. That's right. And once you and one of your friends or a few of your friends are watching the same live stream, whether it's a TV station or somebody broadcasting or an advertiser, you're, you're watching the same uh, stream, then you would want to interact with each other and create kind of a chat room mm -hmm. that you can comment on the content and discuss it while it is going on. So ah. I think this in the future can create this type of uh, social experience right. where you gather around the TV station, but it's not one of the you know, uh, broadcast stations or cable, but it's just some kind of live broadcast that's out there on the internet, and you're all watching it, mm -hmm. and now you can, you can discuss it and collaborate around yeah, it. Yeah, we've seen some of those kind of people building out some of those experiences, but usually on smaller platforms are going to a third party tool like Twitter and, and having a discussion there, but not usually necessarily not with just their friends. Yeah. With, yeah, not integrated. But, but with friends and integrated, that, that certainly becomes more compelling as a sort of a shared virtual uh, living room experience. Right. I'd just be interested to know if you, how that plays on Twitch, how you see that. I mean, there's definitely community on Twitch. Yeah. Is there interaction between people? Oh, yeah, there's a ton of interaction. Um, I think rather than interacting with your friends, you're interacting with uh, you know, people who are watching the same thing as you. It's just mm -hmm. a bunch of random people. Um, 
and uh, it's 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 awesome. You know, if you you watch someone that's like super popular, um, their chat bot or their chat just you know goes crazy. It's like bananas. Um, and you know, it, it, but I think if you put in um, uh, if you're thinking about like uh, you know something like Coachella or like a sports event or something like that, um, I think it would be a really good idea to sort of just. Um, you know, be able to invite just your friends in like a certain chat and then you could just talk with them that way. Um, that way you don't have to, you know, interact with like a lot of other random people, um, unless you want to. Um, and I think that's something that's really cool uh, outside of traditional TV is that you can interact with other people who are watching the same thing as you. Um, and you know, you have a bunch of comments, you can troll someone if you want to, uh, I don't know. All right. Well, uh, sorry. Do you have a comment? John? Uh, I think the other question is about what is what content um, is going to drive growth. I, yes, I think exactly. we'll see uh, massive growth in music. I think music's become. I saw an article last week. Only fifty nine percent of the of the country identifies as sports fans, but ninety one percent of the company listens to twenty four hours of music in a given week, given how ubiquitous and available it is. And I think Live Nation's earnings call. I think it was yesterday, or the day before record consumption of tickets and people t attending experiences. And there's, a, I think, a massive opening to deliver concerts, performances, festivals to fans. You've got genres of music now that are globally popular. Electronic music has largely become propped up ac across digital platforms. That's how that entire genre has kind of taken uh, forth. You've even seen this past year, artists, uh, Esperanza Spalding did a 77-hour continuous live stream of her creating a record. Uh, Katy Perry did a 96-hour continuous live stream of promotion around you know, her life as she launched a record and subsequently a tour. Uh, I think fashion, big, interesting market as well. Uh, the whole food vertical has hyper-exploded the ability to tune in and watch chefs or uh, you know, people preparing meals and interacting with the audience. Huge potential growth there. And again, the, the driver being engagement time. And with live video, we've seen Concerts where people tune in for 25 consecutive minutes on an average. Music festivals, 30, 40, 65 minutes of continuous engagement time. If I'm, again, a brand, a marketer, or I'm a, I'm a platform, that's unattainable in any other form of engagement with a fan. You know, they're lucky, they'll tell us, we're lucky to get three to five seconds of someone's attention. So you've got, but my earlier point of an experience economy as well as an attention economy kind of coming together in live video, done, executed properly versus Throwing up surveillance video, I think people will discover the video. But if you put in, you optimize it, it's higher quality, people can now have a curated social discussion, they can answer polling or trivia, you've got a photo wall, now you've turned somebody from a viewer into a participant. But I think those kind of genres, offer, offering their live content, but also executing it properly, I think creates a pretty big uh, business opportunity. So you're basically looking at, if, if I'm reading it right, high value production, but also introducing the interaction and those kinds of elements. Yeah, and you know, I've, I've done a lot of business on YouTube and other places as well. And you know, the comments in the social stream might be off topic, not related to the video, they could be offensive. Viewers tend to pull away from that. They don't want to bother, that, that becomes a major distraction. We create tools that'll aggregate the conversation, but more importantly, curate it. Mm -hmm. Now the social stream's completely related to the video. So now you're seeing people tuning in, they're engaging, they're sharing it out. The engagement time goes up very, very significantly when you, when you offer that. And there are other tools as well that can be brought into the user experience. Again, I'm not opposed to, uh, I'm an uh, evangelist for all live video, uh, but putting it up for the sake of putting it up, you might connect with an audience, but A, you, know, you want them to engage in the experience and B, inform their community about what I'm watching, what I'm tuning into. Okay. And same for broadcast. The, the, uh, since the introduction of the DVR, there's been a lot of um, the, the consumers have enjoyed the ability to be able to skip commercials, right? So mm -hmm. there's been more of a stress for any commercially funded medium to focus on things where live is a real driver, mm -hmm. sports, events, other things that we've been saying here, um, because there, you know, the value is watching in real time or near real time and not being able ads, yeah. to, to <laughs> skip. So obviously that's a, a key driving force for, for the commercial broadcasters to right. keep that going uh, on the TV side. And on the radio side, it's sort of like that's just a companion, <clears throat> a companion service 
that you, you don't store. You, you, the whole point is you're listening to it in real time all the time, even uh, particularly in cars. And um, uh, that, that's been uh, something that will, I think, continue to happen, even though we see more and more of the sort of um, Pandora, Spotify type um, of, of service working and as ca cars get connected and become internet um, connected as well, there's still a real reason to uh, try to stay live and local for um, r radio services, broad traditional broadcast radio services. But, but all of those are trying to acknowledge the fact that every, even radio now, has a screen in it. There's screens all over the car, and there'll be more as we get into more autonomous vehicles. Right. And so even radio stations have to figure out what else they're going to put on as a visual enhancement content to go along with it. And that's something that they're already doing uh, through something like the Next Radio app, where um, the broadcast uh, audio content still comes over the air, but enhancement content comes online. And this idea of hybrid broadcasting, we think will next happen in television in the next gen uh, platform, ATSC 3.0, or what's called next gen TV. Um, will be the first broadcast system to put IP as opposed to MPEG-2 transport stream as your broadcast uh, transport, which makes it easy for a receiver to now, instead of most, oh, oh, t you can't buy a TV today that doesn't have a, uh, a, a t tuner, TV tuner, and an internet connection for, for online, um, but you watch one or the other. And what we're looking at for the future is hybrid broadcasting where you actually will watch both at the same time. The user don't, won't know what's coming from where, but right. the, the architecture is obviously the common content that everybody watches comes over the air. The personalizable elements that you can choose to add on screen or not mm -hmm. are coming in through the internet connection. Right. And you're watching both together in yep. a kind of converged uh, old term, but maybe finally Coming right. around right, that to integrated interactivity built yeah. into a single screen, whereas what yeah. we've been doing recently is we watch the main content here and then go to our second yeah. screen to right. interact with friends or whatever, or make comments. Uh, or now and it could integrated. it could end up being on a second screen too. But mm -hmm. what, the point is, it's now coming sort of holistically through both channels right. at once. And this this idea of, of the hybrid broadcast will allow something that we used to think of as an oxymoron, personalized broadcasting, right. um, uh, to, to actually happen. So yeah. that's a kind of a key thing that broadcasters are starting to think about how it's a pretty different paradigm right. to, in terms of content creation. But how to, how to do that, how to have the user discover what those extra availabilities are. Mm -hmm. And in the case of radio, it's a lot easier because they just put you know, album cover art or even just the station ID or something more than just a tuner icon on a, on a screen right. for handhelds or, or now increasingly in the cars, too. OK, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's look at a different aspect. And Dan, this is something I think you sort of touched on earlier, the idea that more people are able to create content. Let's talk about the democratiz uh, democratization of production tools. Uh, we're definitely seeing more tools coming up, becoming available with higher quality output uh, and easier usage. So it's, it's uh, definitely something that we could arguably say as we've democratized content creation. Now I can just pick up my mobile phone uh, and, and go live with it. Obviously, you can do some higher quality things than that, but that certainly is uh, making it very easy for anyone to produce their own content. So how do you think that trend is going to affect our live streaming? It, it, more specifically, thinking about those sort of production tools and how they're more accessible to everybody. Is it, uh, you know, does that need for more live content represent more opportunity for smaller production companies? Is it going to be for the users? You know, where, where does that trend take us in the next few years in terms of how content gets created? Anyone? That's good. Well, one thing I, I'd worry about is <clears throat> we've had, you know, you always have the problem of con network congestion. Um, the, one of the things broadcasters now can pride themselves on is infinite scalability, something they never knew they were, but they've always <laughs> been. It's kind of like we didn't know World War I was World War I until we we're going to be called that until later. Um, it w now broadcasters can you know, bring it up in a co cocktail party, you know, <coughs> hey, did you realize that we were infinitely scalable? I mean, you've always been that way. So that's the big challenge for them to try to get uh, away from uh, uh, Con congestion, especially when you've got a big event where a lot of people are watching in real time, it's the same source. Um, 
with this trend that you're talking about, now you have to worry about that same kind of thing happening upstream. Um, which, and because of asymmetrical design of most networks, certainly the mobile, that's, that could become a bigger problem is, uh, you know, streaming video up from your device. Right. So now we have a, a bi-directional congestion problem potentially increasing over time. So networks really have to going to have to try to scale up as that trend continues. Right, I think. more first mile challenges. Oh, yeah, the upstream. Okay. Any other thoughts on uh, production tools and the trends there? Um, Oh, did you want to go for it? Okay. Uh, so we actually have uh, a mobile app right now. Uh, it's Streamlabs. Um, it's the Streamlabs mobile app, and basically you can use it to stream, um, you know, yourself like walking down the street or something, and you can stream directly onto Twitch uh, and YouTube Live, um, and it's you know something called IRL, which is uh, in real life, um, and you know it sort of brings into mind like the. Uh, sort of reality TV, like a reality TV kind of feel for, um, you know, for, for your audience. Um, so if you're not at home uh, and you're not like on Twitch or YouTube Live um, and you're not uh, you're streaming in front of your computer, you can actually bring your chat with you um, using our app. And, uh, you know, a lot of people like it because, you know, there are diehard fans out there for um, specific uh, uh, content creators and, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it works pretty well if you guys want to try it out. It's on Android. <laughs> uh, what, what I would like to see is, is, again, more curation tools that will help you find the content with thousands of people, or millions of people broadcasting. Um, and, and you were mentioning some people are broadcasting their games, some are broadcasting eating food. Yeah. Okay? Right. Which, yeah, seems kind of weird. Who would want to watch people eating? But, but let's say... Let's say there is an audience for people eating, okay? And out of your millions of broadcasters, uh, there's maybe a few dozen that are eating at a certain point. And so I, I would imagine you would need some kind of production tool for somebody who would act as a director, as a middleman, who would say, okay, uh, I'm the food channel of those uh, UGC broadcasts, and I'm going to find the best people who have the most interesting content in this genre or in that, in that genre, and then this guy with a, a producer, content cre curator, uh, he becomes the brand, and he becomes the, the go-to place when you want to see interesting stuff, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, um, uh, esports or whether it's somebody walking down the streets or doing a historic tour of some town. Uh, and a lot of people are out there doing that stuff, but you need to find them. So maybe you need some middleman, and he needs some equipment, you know, bringing in the streams and creating one out of them or switching between them and adding comments, something like that, that can go on top of the UGC streams on one hand. On the other hand, you're creating your own UGC stream that uh, is more valuable because it's like a collection of the best in a certain genre. So it sounds like both a, both a production tools issue and a business issue, really, right? In, right. in terms of the business that you need to change and the way you need to rethink the business model in order to actually drive people to your content and help continue that growth of streaming. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue with that right into that question, it really, the business of streaming. What, what do you think is gonna drive, from a business perspective, what is changing that's gonna drive live streaming or make it more attractive to both producers and consumers? One thing I think ab about all the time for just the points that George's making too is, the metadata requirements and real-time uh, metadata generation yeah. mm -hmm. to try to be able to throw out these keywords or invitations or whatever to the c communities of interest so they can it can help them find this stuff that's being generated on the fly. Right. So not just the media, but the metadata has to come from, and again, going upstream um, from the, uh, the various sources. That's a, that's a big piece of the, the I would think, managing the, the future of that because you know you can you can send that stuff out but if, if nobody's watching it and there may be people who want to watch it but just don't know it's there so that's that's a, a part of you know the, the professional side of the business that gets that and is already working on it but it's the sort of UGC part uh, if that's going to also continue to grow the metadata management and the tools and uh, or automated tools probably um, would have to be uh, part of that and and voice is another piece of all of this that voice controls uh, just taken off just in the last year or two I think we'll see <clears throat> more and more of that be uh, more sensibly integrated into sort of this um, uh, AI 
uh, element of um, real time, even real, real time um, streaming uh, to, uh, it's not really streaming in the sense of, uh, you've seen these new translate um, the, uh, architectures where you can do kind of a real time um, translation. That's a huge AI, that's like Google Translate's the, the world's largest AI application by far. Hmm. Um, and so I think that, a lot of that is stuff that's flowing on the internet. Well, whether you consider that streaming or not, it is voice, it's audio. Right. Um, and so that's a, another important part of the business that uh, I think will we'll come along. So those are just two things right there, the metadata and, and voice activation, um, I think will be big growth, uh, have both have big uh, growth and importance, increasing importance over the next few years. Okay, great. Any other thoughts on what's driving the business? What, what do we need to drive the business? And if not, I can go on to the next one. Well, I find sort of the, the businesses that are different, quite different to, to mine, to what I do. And so I would consider my business sort of production, obviously creating shows, and then the LinkedIn business, and what it is. But the interesting ones that I've gotten from this uh, conference are this, this idea of the tips and, the, and the, the direct payment back to producers, like what, what Twitch does. So that's still a small, I mean, it's probably a minuscule um, part of the market in that sense. But that's, that seems to be driving growth um, the fastest, at least on the, in, in that segment. So the idea that somebody has what they call a tip jar and they can drop essentially small amounts of payment in credits or, or a small payment to those producers, those content creators, and, and reward them for what they're doing. Yeah, and I think that immediately turns around. If I watch some of that content, you'll see a producer that starts off with a relatively small audience and five bucks a month, and I think Twitch lets you go up to 25 maybe now, and obviously your system allows, yeah. allows part of that, you'll see their production value go, right? grow. So that's where you'll see you'll, their yeah. tool grow. So they're going to go okay. from their laptop and wirecast or whatever it may be up to a camera, and you'll see, you'll see that kind of growth. All right, cool. Well, we've talked pretty optimistically about a lot of things that might drive live streaming to higher levels in the future. Let's take a few minutes to be realists or even skeptics and talk about what the challenges that we as an industry might be facing while trying to achieve those high levels of streaming growth. And we'll spend five or 10 minutes on this so we can get to the, the technology aspect as well. So if each of you or any of you have just some brief thoughts on what some of those challenges are, I think we've talked about a few of them, some content discovery, uh, some things like that. that you know, I'd just let's highlight those very quickly. Uh, and, and see what you guys think about that. Yeah, to really following up what you were talking about, though, this, this contribution and ingest problem that will occur with a number of people mm -hmm. uh, contributing content. Yep, first and even, kind of. Yeah, and even for us, getting our content out from multiple spaces up. So there's technology that will help with that. On, you know, I know you're going to roll into that next on the HEBC side, but even some of the other pieces that were talked about this week, the SRT, um, alliance piece, which allow, would allow us to be more reliably send content up. And so the more points of ingest that we're going to start to have, we have to think about the infrastructure, the protocols, and, uh, and the systems to allow us to do that. So that, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think um, <clears throat> as the uh, industry matures, uh, government regulation is a really big challenge, um, mm. especially for uh, you know content. Like You can see that with uh, live streaming in China right now, where the government is sort of like cracking down on um, you know inappropriate or, or harmful uh, content, and um, uh, I think as it grows here, uh, it's probably going to happen to. I mean, uh, you already have YouTube on a sort of demonetization purge right now, where um, you know all these brands um, are finally noticing that uh, they were supporting uh, you know all these content creators who have inappropriate videos or uh, you know just really like just really. Uh, I don't know, politically incorrect videos, and they want to start pulling their channel, like, you know, their videos, um, so that, uh, you know, they can't make money off of that anymore. So, you know, mm. it's something that content creators have to think about now is, um, you know, uh, uh, the type of, uh, uh, just, you know, making sure that they're not offensive. Uh, right, like so that. to some extent, self-regulation before somebody else clamps regulations down on top. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, something that's <laughs> actually really funny is um, I read somewhere that uh, in uh, in China, uh, I guess you know, if you're live streaming uh, and you're a woman, you can't eat a banana on stream because it's uh, you know erotic, but a man can. So I hmm. mean, I don't. <laughs> okay. 
I, I think the, there's a lot of challenges inherent in the online video business as we transition to live. And it was really, the world is really architected for on-demand VOD playback. If you want to go watch a music video today, you go to Vivo, a TV show on Hulu, a movie on Netflix, and anything and everything on YouTube and, and iTunes. What the market didn't contemplate was this dual explosion of connected devices where we'd go from 10 billion in 2012 up to potentially 50 to 75 billion in 2020, combined with this propagation and explosion of social media tools. So, and the quality of the video has gotten better on smartphones. So now there's this rabid demand to consume, especially in our minds, premium live video. And now we have to create and navigate through those challenges and those inherent problems. What we found in terms of, uh, of quality execution, identifying people that have an understanding of the challenges of live television and how that translates to a smartphone or a connected device. And you know, today, executing a Coachella is not, it's a very daunting task. You're producing content on up to seven stages simultaneously. We're delivering out to audiences in the millions and on a thousand plus different device profiles. And now you have to accommodate people that want to post, comment, share, tweet, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot to um, address and deal with going forward, but I think a lot of it stems back to how the, the business has kind of come to life. It's also been, uh, I think, very unexpected. And in the world, I think we're gonna go for another one billion people will get internet connectivity in the next three or four years, and another 10 billion devices are with internet connectivity are gonna enter the market. So it's a opportunity that's also got some challenges to it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and broadcasters are, are pretty sensitive to this. They're, they've built their businesses on the whole premise of a lot of people watching the same thing at exactly right. the same time. Worst case scenario for, <clears throat> for streaming, right? right. Um, so their, their uh, sensitivity to that scale issue mm -hmm. and congestion is, is really, uh, r r really uh, high. So that, that's why they, they need to be um, assured that things are going to get better. So HEVC comes along, that helps a lot, but Ultra HD basically takes all that advantage back right to, to, to zero because right. you know if you, you get two or four times better efficiency Ultra HD uh, over HD, then Ultra HD just uh, eats that right back up. So it's, um, and, and broadcasters are, are already looking and right. already recording a lot of their programming in Ultra HD, even though they're not necessarily delivering it that way yet, they're putting it into their archive. So that's the, gonna be the continual, you know, even as the networks um, uh, can, uh, uh, continue to grow and, and, and uh, have capability growing to, to be able to serve more people with less congestion, it's um, still you know, kind of chasing its tail in terms of <clears throat> how much you can actually benefit over that for the worst case, you know, real time, everybody watching, a lot of people watching at once, the Super Bowl problem, as we call it today, or as we used to call it, Victoria's Secret problem, and right. we've, all <laughs> we've been through a lot of these con congestion crises that we remember, and uh, I think that continue you to were right that the broadcasters really have an advantage here, because you have a guaranteed channel that can go to unlimited number of people. But the problem is, as, as you stated, is that the amount of content has to be limited, right? Yeah. You can have only a few dozen channels on air in each right. geographical location, and you can have maybe 500 channels on cable on satellite, but that's it. Yeah, the, the and, scalability uh, problem on broadcast is the scarcity of, of, of channels. Of channels, and okay. It's, uh, it's, so uh, now, uh, maybe we need to think about the model. If somebody is very popular and millions of people want to view that person, we need to put them in broadcast, right? And how do we do that dynamically, okay? Like uh, <laughs> this person in China walking around eating a banana. Now 20 <laughs> million people want to watch him. I don't know why. Maybe some event has happened. Uh, how do we get that person on a cable channel? How do we get him on an over-the-air channel and, and not have this uh, notion that, you know, there's only license for like dozen number of channels, you know, only ABC, C uh, you know, NBC, CBS, they have the right, but all the others, they have to go over the internet with all the problems of, of congestion. So maybe we can build this type of highway that if there is a business model, because many people want to watch that type of content, we can immediately get that content on air, on broadcast, and make it available to all the uh, you know, right. millions of people. 
And to that point, uh, the, the Next Gen TV ATSC3 system in, uh, includes real-time usage monitoring uh, backwards to the mm. broadcaster. So they might have, and they've been thinking about this as a possibility, that ability to at least measure in real time and see where, whether, okay, it's time to shift something over to the online world because the viewership is down or vice versa. <laughs> Um, and be able to maybe do that kind of dynamic oh. switching and then have the receiver be able to follow if somebody's watching it on one and, and then with seamlessly uh, switch over to the other, uh, the, the other mode. Um, it sounds like science fiction today, but it's actually not. The, the tools are, are being developed to enable that down the, down the road. I Let's get back, uh, uh, sorry, Aaron. Uh, I'm going to actually go back to something uh, Skip was talking about a minute ago, which was HEVC, because I want to touch on the technologies a little bit before we wrap up. And HEVC and Ultra, uh, Ultra HD and how those things are, are potentially going to help or potentially harm at the same time. Uh, what are your thoughts on how HEVC is actually going to help us as far as you know, reducing the bandwidth required to send the content, but on the other hand, HEVC requires more resources to encode the content and to play back the content and usually more expensive hardware at that. What are your thoughts on, on that really quickly? I think uh, really HEVC is the solution to address the, uh, the bandwidth issue. I mean, every generation of codec is a solution that helps relative to the previous generation. Uh, SD broadcast was done with MPEG-2 video. When they moved to HD, uh, it's H.264. And now for Ultra HD, it's HEVC that gives you another 50% benefit on uh, the bandwidth, uh, so, so it solves that issue until the next step of 8K or VR or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, regarding the demands of HEVC, um, th there is kind of a, a notion that you must have hardware in order to encode HEVC, especially for 4K. And uh, you know we're a software company, so we're trying to, to break that uh, rule. And uh, we've recently partnered uh, with Intel uh, trying to see what's the maximum capacity of HEVC and code you can get on a CPU in mm. pure software. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, luckily, Intel is continuing with their progress of uh, having more cores and higher frequencies uh, inside their chips. Yep. And the latest high-end chip is the Intel Platinum 8180. This one has 28 cores, uh, 28 physical cores and 28 hyperthreads on each chip. So a dual socket platform has 112 threads. So we've optimized our software to run on that, and we've done a lot of tuning, uh, eventually enabling us to run six channels of 4K P60 in HDR on a single server. So this is possible today. Now, I don't think uh, that any of you are aware of a 4K channel that is live 24-7 on the internet, right? This is something right. that's not there yet. But now with Apple's support of HEVC and Samsung's support and all the devices out there, I expect that there will be uh, several 4K channels um, out over the internet in 2018, and uh, you'll need the capacity to, to support that, to actually encode. Yep. What, what are your guys' thoughts on 4K and HDR and how they're going to play in? Yeah, we, we've been thinking a lot about that um, from the broadcast side. Uh, Korea has already launched ATSC 3.0, and they're doing a lot with 4K. Their, their target is, was getting it up and running for the Olympics, Winter Olympics. Um, the, the thing that we found with Ultra HD, it's got multiple components to it. Obviously, the spatial um, resolution increase, doubling, uh, is what we call 4K, was first. And it was pr first probably because it was the easiest. Um, and it, it, the, the others, uh, uh, high dynamic range, wide color gamut, 10 bit, um, and then um, high frame rate ultimately are the other elements. Uh, the, the, the 4K one is probably the least important of them because you really don't get the advantage of it unless you're watching really close to the screen or you have a very large screen, uh, right. 80 inches. Uh, so, so, so how will that impact this five years from now? Well, uh, if, whereas the others, the, all those other attributes you see at any distance, any screen size. And so we're, uh, broadcasters are really, and, and by the way, the, the bandwidth penalty is highest to deliver the 4K as right. opposed to all those other right. elements. Right. They all take up less. And plus, then the third element is that the sets, the ones even that have been out for a few years already, there, or even the first um, 4K sets, are do a pretty good job of upscaling uh, HD 2K right. content to 4K 
automatically. Mm -hmm. Where the other stuff, not so much. It, right. it has to be done, you know, creatively. And is HEVC is that going to be the way we get there to get that HDR and and, and you know, well, these additional well, facets besides just 4K? The, the sweet spot that we're finding with HEVC is, and the, the encoders haven't all been optimized even yet for for this um, use case. Is 1080p plus HDR mm -hmm. and white color and, right. and eventually HFR. Okay. And that's really seems to be a, a, a where our HEVC really would shine. Got it. Okay, so that's where we're headed towards a 1080p plus HDR and, and increased color space. For the broadcast, for the, for the, where, there's, yeah, yeah. Where, where you even in, in the six megahertz channels that we have here, you're constrained. Um, but we want to play a, a number of channels and, and okay. HEVC really works, continues to work for SD and HD content too with right. the, the bandwidth uh, savings. Okay. And I think this is relevant for mobile devices as well mm. yeah. because there are mobile phones today like the Samsung S8 that have 4K resolution, yep. but everybody turns that off because you can't see the pixels, they're so small, right. it doesn't make any sense and just draws right. more power. But this phone has HDR and the new iPhones also have HDR. Mm -hmm. So I think 1080p in HDR to the mobile devices uh, will really be a compelling experience for the end user. And uh, I think HEVC will be used for this much more than it will be used for, uh, for 4K yeah. delivery. Okay, I think we need to wrap up given the time, but uh, I didn't see any hands up for questions, but if you have questions, please feel free to stay after and ask. In the meantime, thank you very much for panelists for sharing your thoughts uh, on where we're headed, and thank you audience for sticking around through the last uh, session of Live Streaming Summit, and safe travels home. <laughs>